seat if you'd open up your Bible to Psalm 32. Psalm 32. We've been in a series called Heroes of Faith, and we've been looking at biblical characters. And we, we started off with Abraham and talked about how to get a fresh start in an old place. Last week we talked about the prophet Elijah. Did you enjoy that? That was awesome. How to survive disappointments from the prophet Elijah. This week we're going to look at King David. And the topic is going to be how to be restored. Someone say restored. Just like Rupa's back. Restored, made new, healed, whole. Amen. Psalm 32, let me give you the context. David sins with Bathsheba. You know the story. He goes on to write Psalm 51. Oh, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. It was after Psalm 51 he wrote Psalm 32. As he begins to deal with himself and others about the restorative power of Christ. Follow with me, if you will, Psalm 32, 1 through 11. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord doth not impute iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old, though my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord for you forgave the iniquity of my sin say la Whew. verse 6 for this cause everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. Phew. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or the, like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and brittle, else they come not near you. Verse 10, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad and rejoice. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let us pray. Father, I thank you that you take us from glory to glory, that you do not leave us where you find us, that the restorative grace of God is made evident as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Lord, I pray you work out of us what you have already worked in us, Lord. Grow us into the image and likeness of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, with the power and glory and the anointing upon your word today, Lord. I pray that you would guide us, instruct us, and teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. Wow, Psalm 32. Look at this. David starts. He is so downcast and downtrodden. He's like, oh my goodness, I got caught in my sin. And I have this inequity and this transgression. But he ends by saying, praise ye the Lord. I'm restored. I'm new. I'm well. I'm whole again. Amen. Has the devil ever tried to recycle your sins? Amen. David teaches us in Psalm 32 how to experience the joy of restoration. Young King David's going through a rough time, and God is teaching him and us a very valuable lesson. His sin with Bathsheba. Nathan, the prophet, confronts him. He writes Psalm 51, Oh God, what did I do? Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew in me a steadfast and upright spirit. And he has this encounter with God in Psalm 51. But I've come to ask you today, what is the root cause of misery in our lives? What is the root cause of happiness in our lives? How does forgiveness of sin bring relief to a heavy heart? 
Uh, Why did David say, don't be foolish like the horse or the mule in verse 9? I don't know. How how can a manipulator, an adulterer, a murderer shout for joy in Psalm 32 and say, hey, praise ye the Lord. How can he do that? What kind of person commits a sin like that? Can I tell you what kind of person? A human being. The Bible says we're all sinners saved by grace. Right? But David has a repentant heart. Pastor, why are you so enthused about Psalm 32? Well, for 19 years, I've been looking at this the wrong way. And God corrected me about two weeks ago when I wrote this. I used to think David wrote Psalm 32 out of this distress and despair, and he was agonizing, and then he wrote 51 and said, create in me a clean heart, O God. That's not the way it happened, Mike. He wrote Psalm 51 first, Created me a clean heart, O God. And then he writes Psalm 32. Oh my goodness, the sin, the iniquity, the, the, the transgression. Wow, I'm thankful, Lord, for your forgiveness, for your mercy, for your grace, because I was hiding it from you. You were, so Why do you want to conceal what God wants to carry away? And all of a sudden he says, thank the Lord this got out in the open. But he still has to go to work on Monday and talk to Joab, and, con- and have a conversation with Nathan, he still has the whole nation looking at him like, what did you do? And he begins to deal with the inner turmoil in his heart. Are you following me? So in Psalm 51, he talks to the Lord about creating in, with me, creating in me a clean heart. He repented out of anguish from his soul. In Psalm 32, it's composed after his deliverance from that sin, and there was some, but he's dealing with the spiritual implications of his sin. It's quiet in here. I'm never comfortable when I don't have inward peace. Amen? The lack of it usually makes me ask why. After Psalm 32 is written, David arises out of his spiritual distress. Something tells me that for a period of time, David didn't feel forgiven. Have you ever not felt forgiven? Yeah. I mean, you're, it's human, right? I, uh, you say, Pastor, I don't feel forgiven. I said, forgiveness is not a feeling. The Bible says it's a choice. God has already decided your forgiveness on the cross. Amen. I should not doubt God's forgiveness. Other people, well, we could talk about that. <laughs> Psalm 32 uh, was to reveal the celebration of happiness that comes to those that experience God's amazing grace. He, all of a sudden, now he feels forgiven by the end of Psalm 32, and he says, oh, praise ye the Lord. Your eyes are back upon me. We're, we're, we're good, God. And, but, you know, I, I trust you, Lord. Psalm, th- Psalm 32 was written to show us how we can be glad and rejoice and shout with joy after God restores us. Amen? How does the Lord put a new song in your heart? I mean, we all go through things during the week, right? We all come in on Sunday with a whole bunch of minutiae that we've went through during the week. But hopefully when we leave here, we've transa- we transacted some business with the Lord. And we leave here. You ever leave here singing with one of the songs on your heart all week? And I'm, in, I'm walking around, show us your glory. And I'm singing all the songs. How, did, how does God do that? Like, how does he deposit that in you? And all of a sudden, he puts a song on your heart. Well, that's called doing business with God. This is what David is going through here in Psalm 32. He said, Lord, would you, would you carry away from me what, what's actually harnessed inside of me? It doesn't belong here. What is the root cause of a joyful person? Is it possible to shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph? Well, God teaches us three simple words in Psalm 32. Number one is forgiveness. Number one is forgiveness. So the psalmist, David, begins a psalm with the word blessed. He says here in Psalm 32, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. What does the word blessed mean? It's a Hebrew word that uh, expresses the highest exuberance of joy. I know when we go on vacation, Denise, she always says, make sure you, you bring the aloe, the sunburn lotion. Anybody ha- sensitive to sun? Right? Amen. So somehow we put on sunscreen 172, but we all seem to get sunburn. But 
Pastor Chris packed away, brings the aloe vera. And I say, oh, I could be a blessing because I have the aloe vera. And once the aloe vera is applied to the skin, we, it brings relief. Someone say relief. It brings relief, right? And God is saying he wants to bring relief to the life of David, but he has to apply the forgiveness. Right? He has to walk in forgiveness. It's like taking, anyone wake up with aches and pains? You have to uptake Advil, right? You take the Advil and it relieves the inflammation and then you can say, wow, I'm, I'm blessed. I, I, I can move, I'm blessed. Why did David have this highest exuberance of joy? Because he talks about three words of failure and they're followed by three words of God's amazing grace. I'll talk to you about the failure first. First, he talks about transgression. Then he talks about sin. Then he talks about iniquity. I want to start with sin first. What does sin mean? Sin simply means missing the mark or missing the will of God. The Hebrew word is pagal. It means, look, we're all sinners saved by grace. Amen? We all make mistakes, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. We're all going to make mistakes. But David mentions another word, transgression. Transgression is an act of rebellion towards God. The word means to step over a boundary, to cross the line. It speaks of an open rebellion against the clear commands. My mother used to say to me, Chris, now you've crossed the line. Have you heard that one? Right? Now you've crossed the line. And I go, uh oh. And the way she would look at me would let me know there's trouble coming. So, Sin is just missing the mark. We all sin. Transgression is I do it, I cross the line, and I know I shouldn't be doing it. Then he mentions a third word, iniquity. Iniquity is when it has a hold of you, and you actually like doing it, and it's wrong. It becomes a stronghold. Come on. A stronghold. It owns you. You know you shouldn't be doing it. You cross the line and you still stay there. So David said, I was messed up. He said, I had sin. It went into transgression and it went into iniquity. Right? It's a conscious act, intentional act of doing wrong. Uh, iniquity means now that now it owns you, the sin. No control. The zero conviction of the Holy Spirit. If transgression is defiant, then iniquity is defiant on steroids. Amen? Hey, pastor, how can you rejoice and be glad when you experience, how can David say, oh, praise ye the Lord, after he went through all of this? Well, God's answer was the cross of Jesus Christ. You can rejoice and be glad because God has equally matched the sin, the transgression, and the iniquity on the cross of Jesus Christ. It's been matched by, I say, a trinity of grace. The Bible says here that you can be forgiven. Amen? What does it mean to forgive? The Hebrew word forgiveness means to lift up, to bear, and to carry away. This was the work, what God was doing when Jesus Christ himself carried your sins upon him. Right? It was the work of Christ that lifted and removed your sin from the sight of God. God removed your sins, the Bible says, as far as east is to the west. Where did they go? I don't know. I can't find them. They went on to the cross of Christ. He went on to the cross of Christ. Forgiveness means another person carrying the burden of your sin. Chris's sin was lifted off of me at the moment of salvation. And then when I keep sin any sinners in here? Three of you? The rest of you need to repent. Right? I will sin today sometime. I'll sin today. I'll miss the mark. I'll make a mistake. I'll answer my wife back. I'll answer my parents back. I'll have an attitude. Or I'll, or I'll think I'm going to go into Zingo's at 4 o'clock and not experience Super Bowl chaos. <laughs> right? That's not going to happen. It's a picture of the scapegoat in Leviticus 16 where Aaron would place his bloody hands on the goat that they would take out into the wilderness. It's a removal of your sin. Not, we're not only forgiven, the Bible says, but, but he, David goes on to say uh, in verse 1, blessed whose sins are forgiven and covered. Someone say covered. What did he have to add in the word covered for? A Hebrew word for covered means to cancel from the sight of God so that God cannot bring it up anymore as a ground for his displeasure. 
Let me say it again. It means that God doesn't recycle your sins. The devil does. The devil will say, Chris, remember what you did in 1982? And I'll say, oh, yeah, that was bad. You're no good. You're no good. And I'll come into agreement with that. You're no good. When God has already says, Chris, I've, I've removed that from you. I've already forgiven you. Your sins are covered means that God in Christ has put your sin out of his sight. Never, have you ever lost a sock doing the laundry? <laughs> have APB out on these socks. Have a drawer full of socks. Now I know they're in the house somewhere. But I just, right or wrong? It's crazy. I can't find the sock. Who took the sock? No one else was in the house. The sock is in the house, but I can't find it. It's the same way with your sin. When you, when you repent, God removes it where you can't find it anymore. Out of your sight. No match to it. Right? Your sin has been covered. It refers to the mercy seat. The box with the Ten Commandments, the top covering was called the mercy seat. The mercy seat would cover the broken Ten Commandments that Israel broke. That's why it was called the mercy seat. God's telling us, I will, I will extend my mercy to you through the cross of Jesus Christ if you just receive it. If you come into agreement with me, Chris, I'll forgive you and remove your sin as far as east is from the west. Amen? That's why it's called the mercy seat. The covering enables God to treat the sinner as if you and I have never sinned. You ever see the Geico commercial? Where the kid comes in, he wrecks the car. Right? He comes in with the car keys. Hey, mom and dad, uh, I know we got Geico. And I uh, had a vendor bender with the car, but don't worry. I called Geico already, and we're all covered. And she says, three weeks without the car. Okay, bye. And he runs out. But we got more coverage than Geico. We have more coverage than Geico. But see, he was, he was apprehensive to go in and tell mom and dad about something that was broken. It's like you and I having to approach his throne of grace and saying, God, I messed up. I got into a spiritual fender bender. And, and, and I need to bring it before the throne of grace. So I'm knocking on your door and I'm asking you for forgiveness. And God says, okay, Chris, you asked for forgiveness. Now I'm going to... Forgive you, not based on the way you feel, but based on my word and on the cross of Christ. Now I'm forgiven. But Monday morning, I still got to go down to the table with mom and dad. And is mom and dad going to act like they forgave me? Or are they going to bring it up again? Come on, parents. Are you going to bring it up again? You, you wrecked the car last week. You wrecked the car three weeks ago. You wrecked the car last month. How many times... Do we bring it up and remind them? God doesn't work that way. Don't use this against me, I'm telling you. Don't use this one against me. This is not God's way. It's your parents' way. So God says, I'm not going to bring it up, Chris. Once we deal with it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I uncover it so it can be carried away. So, and then he says, I, I, have, I have forgiven, I have covered. And then he uses the word, I imputeth not. The first two words, forgiven, and covered are positive, but imputeth is, is a negative word. But he says, I imputeth not. Now, imputation, not amputation, imputation is, is, a, um, is a, Bob is a, uh, a word that uh, an accountant uses. It's, it's to make a ledger, it's to make a ledger, your gains and your minuses, one on each side, amen? It says, it describes, I, he imputeth not, David says, what God does not do, imputeth not. God says, Chris, I don't even count the sin against you because it's canceled. It's a bookkeeping term. It refers to two ledgers. Here, follow me. God writes my sin onto Christ's ledger and punishes the sin. How? The sin has to be punished. It's already done. 2019 years ago. He, he, I could take my today, my sins from today and imputeth onto the cross of Christ from 2,000 years ago. He not only takes that, but then he takes the righteousness of Christ and he puts it on my side, on my ledger. 
<laughs> There's a divine transaction that goes on that God takes my sin, puts it back on the cross, and in exchange for the righteousness of Christ, the Bible says, now you and I have the righteousness of Christ. The devil can't stand that. Right? Now you understand why David is so full of joy as he finishes Psalm 32. He's like, praise the Lord. My sin is forgiven. It's covered. He understands the concept of forgiveness. It's an act of a will to repent and say, I'm sorry. But sometimes when we say sorry to God, we still deal with the fallout of the emotions of it. Amen? My mom used to say, are you sorry, Chris? Or are you just sorry you got caught? I say both. She says, we'll see if you're really sorry, because if you're sorry, you won't do it again next week. See, I'm not only breaking my mother's heart, my father's heart, my sin breaks God's heart. And if I know it breaks God's heart, then I don't want to touch it. I don't want to go there again. I don't want to do that again. Do you understand? Do you understand what David's going through here? He's dealing with some internal stuff. And it's how we process that stuff that's going to have a praise of the Lord on our heart. Because the ultimate goal is restoration. He remembers his sin. He remembers his transgression. He remembers his iniquity. He knows he messed up. He understands that he missed the mark. And David is struggling with, I can't believe I did that. What's worse, he says, man, am I ever going to do that again? So he goes into work Monday morning after he writes Psalm 51, and there's Joab going, Psst, some king you are. Can't keep your eyes off of that girl. And Nathan, there's Nathan on the other side of the table looking at him going, que paso? I'm watching you. I'm watching you, David. No more looking out the window when you should be in battle with your men. So now he, he's okay with God, right? He's okay this way. But now he's got to make things right this way. So now he, the people, he gives a State of the Union address and the people are going, I'm not going to that. You hear about she was pregnant? Pfft. Listen, sin will take you further than you want to go. That's why I, I talk to kids about sex outside of marriage. Right? We had it happen in our last church. Told them, them too. I was like, I'm going to find out the hard way. She gets pregnant. I have to deal with the fallout. Right? I had to deal with the fallout. Her career, her life got put on hold. He, he don't want to go to church anymore. And I said, you heard me preaching about it. Your sin will take you further than you want to go. If you really love God, if you really, if you really love God, you'll be responsive to the scriptures saying, I shouldn't be doing that before I'm married. I shouldn't be doing that. I know it's not easy to hear, and I'm just giving you the Bible. I'm just giving you what the Bible says. Only to protect you because I love you. I don't want the devil to destroy you. So I'd rather the word of God be operational in your life, and then you could be responsive to that and steward the word of God correctly. True spiritual contentment, folks, is defined as a heart that's clean, forgiven, and honest before the Lord. David experienced the depth of his sin and the heights of the grace of God. He's telling us that true spiritual contentment is found in spiritual cleansing. It's he's forgiven. His sins are carried away. They're covered. What, what was broken, what was concealed is now revealed, but it's covered by the blood. And imputeth not means that his sin is taken from one ledger and placed on another ledger. So that's why David was so blessed. Blessed is the man whose transgression, inequity, and sins are forgiven. And then he gets on to point number two, folly. He says, you know, Lord, it was just stupid of me to try and cover that up. That's why I always tell the men, do you have a Nathan in your life? Well, you better find one before God sends one. Right? And so he's like, man... He goes on in verses 3 and 4. When I kept silent, my bones waxed and roaring all day long. Night and day, the Lord's hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. 
David's saying, Lord, why did I want to cover up what you want to carry away? Right? <laughs> why is this recorded? To show us the folly and the foolishness of not repenting and turning towards Christ. What happens when we resist the Holy Spirit and stay silent and refuse to cry out to God? David says his bones got old, which means David became physically sick over the condition. Night and day, your hand was heavy upon me. David feels the withdrawal of God in his life. Then David says, my tears are all dried up. The spiritual heavens are closed. The dew and the rain are withheld. Why? Because David can't even get to God in prayer unless, God allow, unless he deals with what God wants him to deal with. The process will hold true for all those who want to possess, possess the same kind of contentment and joy in Psalm 42.12. For innumerable evils have encompassed me. My iniquities have taken hold of me, that I might not be able to look up. They are more than the hairs on my head, therefore my heart faileth me. This is what happens to David. He gets into a very ugly place. And how do you escape this folly, this foolishness of, of not being clean with God? He says, I, in verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to thee. My iniquity I have had, had, hid not. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. David bears the pressure long enough. His anguish becomes so deep. He becomes so discontented. He says, that's it. I'm turning back to the Lord. I confess my sin, my iniquity I have hid not. I will confess my transgressions. David resolves to agree with God what he's been saying about the sin. He doesn't hide it. He doesn't make any attempt to cover it up. He confesses it and he says, Blessed is the man or Selah. Blessed is the man or woman where whose spirit there is no guile. There's no deception. Our hearts can be free from guile and deception when we're open and honest before God. Blessed are those who do not excuse their sin, but cast it openly on the Lord. Blessed are those who do not deny their shortcomings. Any perfect people in here? Right? There's none of us that are perfect. Not one. Only Jesus was perfect. When David sinned with Bathsheba, he tried to cover up the sin. He succeeded for about a year. Oh, some people knew about it, and some people did not know about it. But, but, but Nathan, Nathan exposed it. Right? And he went up to David, and he just, he said, you know what? I'm going to just, oh my goodness, David, what are you doing? And David walked around. With the sin that stained his life. It stained his life. It stained his life. But he found out something about the grace of God. About the grace of God. About the grace of God. He said, Lord, I'm not going to cover up what you're trying to carry away. And he said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew in me a steadfast spirit. I, I don't want to sin against you no more, Lord. I know that hurt you. It hurt me. It hurt everybody. I'm turning from that. And I'm turning to you, Lord. And David lived in unconfessed sin. He was a different man. For David and you and I. When we live in unconfessed sin, the soldier will lose his strength. The sinner, I mean the singer will lose their song. The saint will lose its satisfaction. His world was literally turned upside down. As God began to wax heavy on David's heart, David sacrificed peace, joy, and contentment on the altar of selfishness and sin. He paid a high price for low living. I'll tell you the truth is God loves us so much, he wants us to come to the mercy seat to experience the forgiveness and grace. Well, pastor, I'm caught up in sin and sexual sin and this type of sin and, and this type of financial sin and that sin and, re and rebellion in my heart. Pastor, what do I do? Bring it to the Lord. Amen. Bring it to the Lord. In fact, don't tell me because most of the people that tell me wind up leaving the church. Yeah, believe it or not. The ones that tell you the dark, darkest, deep, deepest sins have to deal with guilt, and then they think I'm always preaching about them, which I'm not. <laughs> That's why I say I'm a bring it to the Lord. 
It's, this is what God, it doesn't say here, bring it to the pastor. It doesn't say, it says confess your sins to one another, yes. But primarily, you would to bring it to the Lord. Bring it to the Lord. Bring it to the altar. Bring it to the prayer meeting. Bring it to the Lord so he can lay the ax to the root. And we're always dealing with the fruit, but we're not dealing with the root. Amen? So God says, let's park view. Let's start dealing with the root. Get to the Lord. Galatians 5.17, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another. So, you know, you know D- David figured this out. He's like, man, this is the flesh, and this is the spirit. I want to be walking in the spirit. As a child of God, I discovered I can't get away with anything. I'm at, you know, in front of the Lord, you can't get away with anything. But if I ignore the still small voice of the Holy Spirit... Man, my heart will become hardened. Second Timothy 4.2, it says, a conscience that can become seared with a hot iron. But God doesn't want that. He says, that's all folly. Don't hide from me what I want to carry away from you. So you have number one, forgiveness. Number two, folly. And number three, freedom. Freedom. Can the worship team come? In other words, God doesn't want your past mistakes to dictate your future. Sometimes we get so stuck in our mistakes. And God's forgiveness is a gift to every believer, folks. It's a hope that he imparts to you through Christ. It's absolute, undeniable. The happiest people on earth are the ones that experience the healing, cleansing, and forgiving grace of Jesus Christ. They refuse to torture themselves in vain by covering up what God wants to carry away. Look at verse 6 and 7. He says, now, Lord, I'm back in good standing with you. You have given me the privilege of divine protection. Those who walk with the Lord enjoy a place of refuge and safety. Those that are in close fellowship with God, he, 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 he turns to God in times of trouble, times of temptation. In verse 7, he talks about the privilege of divine preservation. Trials and trouble will come to all of us as we pass through this life. However, the saint of God who walks with the Lord will find that they are preserved through it all. Amen? Amen? And then in verse 8 and 9, he says, I have the privilege of divine proximity. He says, Lord, your eyes are back upon me. Do you ever have your mom and dad give you the eyes? They have a whole conversation with their eyes. My mother at the, at the table, she just used to give me the mother's eyebrow. I knew what that meant. Bop bows. She didn't have to say a word, but her eyes told the story. David says, Lord, your eyes are back on me. It, he was smiling about, he's like, David, good job. You came to me with the stuff. And I've carried away what you wanted to cover up. You can hide it from your parents. That's, that'll work for a time. But you'll never hide it from God, boys and girls. You'll never hide it from God. You want to have good standing with God. We're all going to make mistakes, so this is not condemnation. Romans 8.1, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. This is how David got a hold of God and God got a hold of David. And how God still gets a hold of us. Where he says, okay, come closer. It's okay. Your sins are forgiven. And then David says in verse 10, I have, all of a sudden I have peace. David says, I don't know what you see. I don't know what you've been looking at. But he was forsaken so that I can be forgiven. Isn't that so cool? He carries away what Chris wants to cover up. Amen? See, my friend said the same bee that stings you can be the same bee that makes honey for you. Right? And then he ends in verse 11 and 12 and says, oh, praise the Lord, I'm back on holy ground. <laughs> the, the, the privilege of divine praise. Those who walk with the Lord have a purity and they have a reason for praise. The saints of God are saved and secure in their relationship with God. If they're walking with Him, they are sanctified and clean. They enjoy the best the world has to offer. Why? Because they understand that God has encompassed them with songs of deliverance. In other words, 
those who know the Lord have every reason to lift their voices. Come on, let's stand to our feet this morning. Come on, if you're here today, if you're here today and you need something restored in your life, I don't know what it is, something that needs to be restored. Can I tell you something? Watch, follow me now before you start. Follow me. You can play lightly. Hold on. Watch. It's after all of this, David writes Psalm 23. See, you think he wrote it when he was 17? Nope. He wrote it when he was 40. All of a sudden, David gets done with 51, 32, and he goes, man, so glad that's behind me. Have you ever been there? So glad that's behind The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me, he maketh me lie down. Lie. Turn to your neighbor, say neighbor. Go ahead. Lie down. He maketh me lie down. He leadeth me by still waters. He, he what? He what? He restores my soul. There can be no restoration of the soul unless you get to the still waters. You can't get to the still waters until he makes you. Get down there, Chris. He makes you lie down in green pastures. And if you don't lie down in green pastures, he's not all you want. I have to question whether he's your shepherd. He's my shepherd. I shall not want. So I'm gonna, he's going to make me lie down in green pastures. He's going to lead me beside still waters. Why, Chris? So he can restore my soul. What do you need restored? Get back to the shepherd. Get back to the shepherd. Get back to the shepherd. He wants, he wants to impute the righteousness of Christ. You have a physical, in your first physical healing in your body. Come forth. First is physical healing. Physical healing. Physical healing. Relational healing. Something's broken in a relationship. Something's broken in a relationship. Something's broken. Remember, God can't carry away what you're covering up. Something's broken. Something's broken. And he wants to heal it. He wants to heal it. He wants to heal. He wants to heal. Today, he wants to heal. This week, this month, this year, he wants to heal. Hallelujah. We're going to lift our hands to the Lord. Just repeat after me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul, my body, my mind, my heart, my relationships for his name's sake, that I may be the righteousness of Christ. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew in me a steadfast and contrite spirit. Lord, heal me. Raise me up. Use me mightily in my next season. Lord, you know my heart. You know what needs to be healed. I ask by the blood of Jesus that you heal me of every sickness, infirmity, bitterness, unforgiveness. I will not hide what you want to carry away. I love you, Lord. I thank you in advance 
for healing me in the priceless, matchless name of your son, Jesus Christ. Now we're going to sing the song we had. Let's, let's worship the Lord together. Let this be the song from Psalm 32, verse 10. I'm going to praise you, Lord. I'm going to praise you, Lord. I'm going to continue to praise you, Lord. 